Hello there, my name's PsychDuck, and in this video we're going to be talking about how to class it up. Specifically about how we measure it and how it affects mental health. So we're going to be looking at three ways in which the medical profession grades class and general deprivation in society, and specifically looking at the UK. Whilst there are terms already in common use, like... Poshos. Bansha! Ciao! There are more scientific systems to use. The first one to look at is the principal way of social stratification seen in the UK, and that is occupational classification. The job of the head of the household is used to determine this, and there are six classes. Professionals and managerial, intermediates, skilled manual and clerical, semi-skilled, unskilled, and unemployed. So that's one to six. The classification list was derived in the 1950s by the National Readership Survey and is used for a lot of market research. It has been replaced by more complex systems over the past few years, but for the purposes of the medical world, it's still in use. Unsurprising, given how old some of our computers are. Also unsurprisingly, this class list doesn't even feature upper class individuals, but broadly works out as class one, professional and managerial as the upper middle class, the, the intermediate class being the middle middle class, the third class skilled manual and clerical being the lower middle class, four being the semi-skilled being the skilled working class, five being the unskilled workers or the unskilled working class, and six is still unemployed, but not like rich unemployed, just unemployed and struggling. This stratification has received a lot of flack in the past as it solely takes into account job role without any other indicators such as area people live in or actual remuneration for the job despite experience levels. I'm just going to say pay doctors a proper wage here. Other tests include the Jarman Index or the Townsend Deprivation Index. The Jarman Index was devised by a GP shockingly named Jarman and is based on census data looking at elderly people living alone, single parents, children under five, unskilled and unemployed individuals, ethnic minority groups, overcrowded homes and changes in address recently. It's not widely used outside of the UK and even here has been superseded by other forms such as the Townsend Deprivation Index. So the Townsend Deprivation Index looks at the general deprivation of an area by measuring just four factors. Unemployment, non-car ownership, non-home ownership, and home overcrowding. So it's often linked to a postcode, and that's to help it m make it more applicable as a, as a tool. So a higher score on the Townsend Deprivation Index means more deprivation. So why am I talking about this in a psychiatry-based video series? Typically, mental health issues are more common in lower social classes or where there is more deprivation. There are, however, four controversial exceptions. Anorexia, bipolar disorder, unaliving oneself, thank you YouTube and TikTok and other social media filters, and alcoholism are often seen as, at times, bucking the class trend. With anorexia, there's a query over whether this is an actual increase with higher social classes, or is it because we see a different pattern of health-seeking behaviour from people in different social classes? For example, people in a higher class tend to seek medical help sooner than those in lower classes. When looking at clinical studies, so looking at those coming into services, we see a higher number of social classes, one and two, from anorexia patients. However, there are, few, there are very few differences or variants in the clinical features or family relationships across the social groups when these patients are reviewed. So the anorexia nervosa patient who has a complex and problematic relationship with her parents, this is replicated all across the social groups. One difference is that the prodrome, and for those unaware, a prodrome is the symptoms that start to come on before an illness actually takes hold. So the prodrome of diet consciousness and the onset of the actual disease in anorexia nervosa are considered to have a slightly earlier age of onset in social classes one and two. On the other hand, community studies have shown that urbanization, the process of moving to cities, has had a far bigger impact on the diagnosis and prevalence of 
anorexia nervosa, bulimia, and binge eating disorders. So, in these community studies, the social class, professional status, and education levels are found to not increase the risk of reporting an eating disorder. This difference between the clinical and community studies leads to the contention of the acceptance of anorexia as something which affects higher social classes more. Now bipolar disorder is a bit of a different beast. Bipolar individuals tend to have siblings and children of a higher social class, but they themselves are often relegated to a lower social class. This is likely the effect of the disease on their life and ability to work within society, especially in the times before mood stabilizers or effective treatments were available. And even in my own practice, I have seen more than a few high level bipolar individuals who, when they become manic or whatnot, have to take significant times off work and to be properly medicated. And frankly, without treatment or medication, as much as the anti-psychiatry movement may disagree with me, without these options, these people would not be able to live full and well lives and flourish in the past. The higher the patient's parents' social class, their educational history and their material wealth, so of the parents, have all been shown to increase the likelihood of bipolar disorder. So this means as we go up through the social classes, how if your parents are richer, you are more likely to have bipolar. One theory put forward about this is that the genes associated with bipolar may confer some form of advantage, likely in terms of superior creativity or productivity, which allows relatives with those genes, but not the associated mental disorder, to uplift themselves. Unaliving oneself like anorexia, is another condition where there are contradictory studies. There are some showing unaliving is more associated with a higher social class, others showing it is more associated with lower class. Currently, we would say that there is a sharp increase of rates of people unaliving themselves with either end of the with either extreme end of the wealth scale, but we don't have anything more definitive than that. What has been shown, though, is that those who suffer from a mental illness who are of a higher social class are more at risk than those at a lower class. Alcoholism, much like a general bender, is the great equaliser and seems to defy social boundaries. There is some evidence that it appears more in upper classes, but when those individuals are forced to move down social classes because of their alcoholism and other health problems, they take their alcoholism with there, and now it appears all the way through society. It has been noted that the differences in alcoholism appear to be established in adolescent years, but not necessarily tied to a social class. So the more important factor is what your life and drinking is like during adolescent or formative years, as opposed to which class you live in throughout your life. The most prevalent influence on alcohol use and related harm was the public health policies regarding how much alcohol is sold for and where it is sold. As much as people do not like things like alcohol tax or minimum pricing, they have a significant deterrent effect on alcoholism. So that's a whistle-stop tour of how we look at social class in the UK. But why do we do this? It's by no means a perfect system and we have to take each patient as an individual when we treat them. But unfortunately, wealth is a massive advantage in our society and those at the bottom rung of that ladder tend to miss out the most, both physically and mentally. And until we do something to change that and we start actually working towards caring for each other, this is going to continue. These classifications provide a rough idea when you meet someone in the community, in a clinic, in a consultation of what services they may know about, what are the limits of their life, what they can do, understand and take guidance on, and hopefully allow you to provide a more sensible clinical outlook and advice. Patients suffering from extreme levels of deprivation, of worrying where their next meal is coming from, of worrying if they're going to lose their home, are going to be far less likely to engage in long-term treatment regimes like therapy and whatnot because they have far more pressing issues that they need to deal with. And unfortunately, this leads to many problems being passed down the road. And it, it's awful, and realistically, we should be working to make sure everyone was not food insecure, was not home insecure, had what they needed. 
but that's not the way of the world at the moment. So hopefully in the future, all this stuff I've been talking about will just be some weird, odd video for future students to look at as how crazy the uh, 21st century was with our wealth disparity that's more like pre-French Revolution era levels now. And on that depressive thought, um, I'm going to say I'm Psych Duck, and I'm saying good night, YouTube, and good mental health, if you can afford it. I live on the fringe. Fringe class is.